Welcome, everyone. I am your host, Jack H. I am broadcasting from the North American headquarters of the Cheese Room Podcast Show. Our goal for the next hour is to feed your Spurs craving during this annoying international break. And to assist me in this endeavor, we have an international panel, and I want everyone to note, no one from the UK is present, so we should have a really good show for... <laughs> For once, anyway. Nice. So on the panel with me, uh, starting to my my left or right, depending on how you want to look at it, we have our we have our international panel come from Australia. First, Dave, how you doing? How you doing? I guess it would be this morning. Oh, I'm doing very well, thank you very much. I'm a little bit conflicted by you saying that no one from the UK is on, and uh, it'll be a good show because I can't deny that my Dang. my roots. I can't deny. Dollars Hill Hospital, North London, that saw the birth of me, of which the anniversary is coming up next week. A great Hang moment on. in human history. Hang but on, I was under Hang on. Good. Hang on. Sorry. I think every show I've been on, you've taken offense to the fact when someone refers to you, doesn't refer to you as Nozzy. <laughs> the one time you get that statement, you throw it mm -hmm. back at him. You can't win. Is it because mm. because England is uh, currently in the enviable position of holding mm. a nil all draw with Australia? Because you know, JP, that I'll use any argument to suit my <laughs> narrative at any time. <laughs> hello, JP. There it is. Well, and <laughs> JP, okay. that's a good transition to you to say hello. And unfortunately, you can no longer claim that nil uh, all scoreline because England is now up 1-0. Oh, about time. Oh. Well done, England. Well done. You beat the A League eleven. Good job. Um, <laughs> hey, it's good to be here with you all. It's good to wake up in the morning and have something to talk about. So, lovely to be here. Great. Um, thanks. Thanks for getting up early and coming and joining us. And then my my uh, I guess you could even call it my my twin to some extent. Another Jack oh. from North America, just a little further north of me. How are you doing today? Doing well. Good to be back. Um, here to make my sacred cow contribution at some stage. Um, I do look forward to the sacred cows. I think uh, it's it's been a while since the last time I've done one. I felt like I wasn't in as fine a form. I think we did. I'm not sure if we did a Hill Messi sacred cow, but we gave me like a, at least a minute to rant about Hill Messi. Kind of was disappointed in it. So maybe I'll make up for it this time. Well, I hope so, because we're all depending on you. This show, the show's fate and entertainment value is wholly dependent upon your performance on the Sacred Cow. Indeed. So, <laughs> so with uh, no match to really uh, review or preview, we probably have a fairly brief conversation with you guys today. Feel free to jump in the comments. Love to, love to hear any questions you want to throw at the panel. We'll certainly entertain those. Um, and also, don't forget, you can jump over to our Patreon page if you want to support the Cheese Room. We'd love to have you and join our conversations that we have all the time. So what we thought we'd, we'd uh, start off with is very interesting comments from our the consecutive manager of the, man, of the month in the Premier League. We have uh, Ange, who has some comments about Australian uh, football, um, specifically Basically, to summarize his, his, what I've read is saying is that even though Australia did really, really well, uh, by all accounts, in the, in, the, in the World Cup, he doesn't think that Australians are all that interested in football and that the resources are not going to be devoted to developing the game in, in Australia. So I want to kind of, I, I assume you're familiar with the details of this, and I thought I'd kick it over to you, JP. Overall, uh, what are your thoughts that Ange made in his press conference regarding the state of Australian football and its future? Um, I mean, the comments Ange made then aren't anything different to what he's made, you know, since he left the Australian Post. I think to give people context, um, the Australian job was probably the only time since Brisbane where Ange got questioned, and that's because he decided that we wanted to play a different way that was going to enable us to be more competitive at the world cup. And it nearly derailed our uh, qualification attempt. Um, but ultimately he was probably right. And he just wasn't interested in just going and taking part in the world cup. He wanted to compete um, and he got absolute pelters for it. And um, I think that really, really grinded on him. And the fact that, you know, he's right about the Asian cup. We, it was a remarkable achievement what we did at the Asian cup within two days no one was talking about it um you know 
but if I am to look at the newspapers today, the AFL grand final was two weeks ago and they're still talking about Collingwood. So it's, it, you know, football in this country is at a hiding to nothing. Um, and, you know, it's the most participated in the sport. Um, more people play football than anything else, but it is one of the lowest funded sports in the country. So it is definitely up against it as a code. Um, there's no denying that the AFL in particular will do everything they can to push football back. Um, they released their season fixture um, at 6 a.m. on the morning that Australia played Argentina. You can't tell me that releasing a season fixture at 6 a.m. that morning is coincidence. You don't release anything at 6 a.m. in the morning. So, yeah, I and mean, that's the state of Australian football at the moment. It's never going to be our number one sport, at least you know, not this decade. So I can understand his frustrations. He's done amazing things for this country and for this sport. People like riding his wave, but then when it comes to it, they won't ride the game as well. Do you think, in your opinion, with – if he's successful at Tottenham, however we want to define, at least in the Australian public's mind, if he's successful at, at Tottenham, do you think that gives him any leverage or any weight in trying to marshal resources and change the priorities of the, of, of, of the countries and it's along those lines? No, no. Cause we've seen it before. Like the national team has been very successful. We had a, a golden era with the, the Harry Kules and the Mark Vadukas of this world going through, that didn't change funding into the into the game. We had, um, you know, the Socceroos did amazingly at the World Cup with, you know, one of the poorest teams we've ever taken to it. Um, and the conversation was there around the funding in the game, and that lasted all of two days again. And then mm. the conversation died off. It, it won't, like one person doing something won't change. We'll look at it and we'll applaud it, and then we'll go back to the way we have always done things. Um, and as a, you know, a football lover, you know, it grinds me endlessly. But I guess mm. like Ange, a lot of football fans have just kind of gone, okay, this is just the way it's going to be. We've fought the battle and it's it's not changed. Interesting. Dave, uh, you, you, as you uh, pointedly made the uh, statement how you're not actually Australian, but clearly you're an mm. expat. Yeah. What have you, what you say, you have the benefit of, of being living in a country where football is everything. Football is life. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now to a country where it seems to be an afterthought. What are your, what have you noticed about the state of the game in Australia since you've been there? Well, I mean, just the first thing about this picture is that's the first time that Ange met uh, Daniel Day Lewis when he was playing <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. Um, and uh, the start of the partnership that's meant he's now in the, uh, the staff. I could make a my left foot gag, but I think it's a bit early for that. Um, look, I, I, I am, as someone who, uh, you know, obviously I've made a massive contribution to the game of football in this country in the uh, over 40s, over 45s, and uh, funding the Sydney physio uh, through his kids' school education of all my torn hamstrings over the years. Um, and I, I, you know, I've done coaching of kids' teams, refing, and all the rest of it. You know, hand on heart, since I first came to Australia in in, uh, in the last century, I, I've seen football grow in popularity hugely in that time, honestly. Um, I look at kids being interested in talking about football far more over the last uh, X number of years. And for another topic, another time, obviously the brand awareness of Chelsea and City since Abramovich, since 2008 down here is, is huge. And I lived in Hong Kong for a while and it was the same thing as well. So I think the interest in the Premier League has, has massively increased. Um, you know, you've got a telco company down here who bid and won it off uh, Fox about eight, eight, nine, ten years ago. Um, you've had the A-League restarted, um, which was, I think it came around 2005, 2006. Del Piero, I went to the first game there. And I think my impression of, of football before the A-League is that you had teams really, really drawn up on, on ethnic lines. So I think Ange's team in Melbourne started with the, was a Greek, played in the Greek team. Um, and I think that's where Puskas managed, wasn't it, in uh, coach down there. So I, on the one hand, I've seen it really grow massively uh, in, in my perception and in my experience over the last, since I first come here. The point 
that is made by JP about the fact that the AFL releasing uh, the fixture list at 6 a.m., um, about the fact that where there has been crowd trouble in Melbourne, at Melbourne games, but that's Melbourne for you because you've got nothing else to do. Um, and they've really honed in on that as well. It, it shows the the kind of the, the thinking is still amongst you know amongst a, like the generation back or my generation is like soccer or football is played by a bunch of people who dive everywhere and it's not like rugby blah 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 blah. But that's now changing with the younger the next generation, my kids' generation, where through uh, social media, through FIFA, through the, the the thing of of, of the phenomena of Messi Ronaldo where. People, kids will follow where Messi and Ronaldo are playing, not necessarily the team. Um, it, it's something that I just think that over time, I still think there is still an opportunity, and I'm still optimistic that the team, that the, the game will get bigger. Um, that the, the Matildas World Cup, uh, you know, everyone jumped on that bandwagon. If you'd have asked anyone in my office who who played for the Matildas three weeks before the World Cup, they wouldn't have had a clue. But the day of the Matildas versus England semi, the whole office wanted the Matildas to win. Obviously, the Irish, the Welsh, the Kiwis. And I was the lone, once more, I found myself as the lone person standing on the hill, taking a stand. And as I went into the office the next day after we won, I whistled chirpfully to my colleagues. And you loved it. You loved it. Being alone on that hill, you loved it. You know I loved it. (laughs) So do you, the, the growth of uh, popularity of, of European football, in particular the Premier League, and now that I'm mm. as a coach of Spurs, mm. I mean, is, is, the, is the popularity, is more interest in the Premier League and, and possibly Spurs than even the A-League? Or how is that, how's that going? Yeah, I mean, um, the viewing numbers on the Premier League exceed the viewing numbers on the A-League in this country. Mm. Um, but... Uh, I think kind of more to the point that the that kind of generation or the people in media who are, you know, trying to hold football back are very happy for football to be this um, international spectator sport, something that we consume that is produced overseas because it's not then a threat to what you're doing here. And we're happy for people to play the game so long as they attend the AFL and they attend the NRL. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a... There's a weird kind of standoff in that, like, we like it, we'll appreciate it, but it's their thing, not ours. Don't make it our thing. Um, and I think that's the battle that football in this country has to has to win is, no, football can be our thing um, and we, we can be good at it. We just have to invest in it. Yeah. There's no question you have the athletic ability in the country to be ex- to excel. You just have to put money into it. Jack, uh, I wonder, I've never looked at, do you know any knowledge about uh, the like Premier League viewing here in the States versus ML- MLS pre-Messi, of course? Do you have any knowledge of that? I don't follow closely. I enough. imagine it's I imagine it's not even a competition, to be honest. I feel like uh, you know, yeah. there's we're also such an international country anyways that there yeah. are probably a lot of people who don't even care about the MLS, like in the first place, that have lived in the U.S. for quite a long time. I think even... La Liga or sorry like the Liga MX like numbers are even comparable to MLS if not like actually greater when it comes to even like television watching and everything so I think the MLS is actually making actually pretty decent you know like climb but it's I don't think it's ever going to surpass or ever even get close to Liga MX or even you know the Premier League I think just for yeah no that we just seem to just prefer what the best product is and the best product is technically what's out in Europe and I think that's always been kind of the American mentality for a lot of things. It's like, yeah. what's the best out there? And that's what we watch pretty much. I know at one time, League MX was the highest rated uh, soccer football broadcast in this country. I don't know if how long ago. I don't know. I just don't have a good feel MLS for... looks to have higher quality players than actually the League MX now. At least that's yeah. my opinion. They seem to have yeah. far better players now in the league. But in terms of actual overall viewing and attendance, I believe the attendance is not even comparable. Like League MX yeah. has nearly like sold out stadiums for every club, yeah. whereas you can't say that with the MLS. Well, I mean, I, I'm no different. I mean, I, I've never I will not miss the Spurs game. Uh, I mean, unless there's something dra- dramatically going wrong with my schedule, and I won't miss to to be able to see a match. I I n- almost never miss. I've got five minutes from my house. Uh, Division three men's team going to Division two next year, and the top 
uh, one of the top teams in, in the women's game, NWSL, nice. play the same place. I'm a corporate sponsor, you know, for the women's game, and we never miss games. We go to every single one. I'm going Saturday night to the final home game where we'll hopefully we'll get our take the regular season title. And I mean, but yet I've yet to attend an MLS game. I have and a friend most... who is uh, from Louisville, and like that's the only like professionals team they have outside of their college teams, right? And so they actually get huge attendance, I believe, for the Louisville team, but. They it's do. like, but probably similar to North Carolina, like North Carolina has, you know, some attachment to some pro teams, but also like a huge college presence. Right. So it's kind yeah. of like you guys can sort of have the best of all worlds kind of in a way. Yeah. The competition's fierce, but I would say that, I, you know, there's a franchise in North Carolina. I've not to attend a game. I have tickets to see Charlotte FC play uh, their last home game or last game of the season where Messi is supposed to play, but the, the, the ticket price keeps going up and down and up and down based on whether he plays or doesn't play, whether he plays or he doesn't play. So we'll see what happens with that. So um, can I can I just ask about my my, yeah. my American cheeseheads is that you know like us in Australia, plastic or otherwise, you 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 both live in a country where football soccer is not the main sport, and I'm interested to know you know you're obviously both very very passionate about it, and and God knows what awful trick fate has played on you both to be supporting Tottenham. Um, but the, the question really is, is that you're in a, you live in a, you, you grew up in a country where football soccer is not the main sport. And so how, how have you seen it develop in your time? And how do you think it's kind of viewed that as by the mainstream, so to speak, now? One can make the argument that actually it's actually now kind of the main sport or about to okay. become the main sport. When right. I grew up, when I grew up, you did play, you know, football or soccer, but it wasn't nearly like watching a Premier League game was really hard, especially in the West Coast where I grew up. It was very difficult. You, you know, you're mm -hmm. actually more likely to be able to watch like Genoa versus Empoli than you were able to watch like Man United versus Arsenal mm -hmm. sometimes. And that's what you were sort of just given. And I feel like nowadays, though, like I'm watching kids in Brooklyn wearing like Chiro Immobile, you know, kits and like the stuff like that that are like eight years old. There are far more kids I'm seeing wearing like a Lazio or like a Juventus or even I just saw the other day like a random like really cool Ibrahimovic kit like that a kid had that was looked very expensive. <laughs> looked like he probably asked for it for his birthday or something like that. Right. And the kid was like 10 or 12 years old. So I actually feel like nowadays it's sort of kind of you could make the claim in the next 10 years it actually probably will be the most popular sport whether we'll be the best at it or whether we'll be any better at it is another question i think we will be but it's always the case that i think you know the us has had its own sports we've had our own you know yank invented sports that we're very good at but i think more and more and more the more international also the us becomes and the more kind of you know globally connected we all are i think you know americans more and more will just kind of just prefer football because that's what everybody else in the world seems to watch I think you're right in the sense that early on, BN Sports and other networks were the only ones. I mean, they'd have they'd have uh, Italian football, they'd have German football. You could catch that. It, but once once Ted Lasso and NBC uh, got the contract with Premier League, uh, it's been in a, it. NBC has done an unbelievable job in promoting the sport, putting real money behind it, and the ex, and the and the and the bars that have exploded all over the country that where people are gathering at 7:30 in the morning to watch is been amazing. I can't if I go to when I go to the North Carolina FC tomorrow night, I promise you there will be a kid in a sun shirt at that game. There will be there will be there will be a kid in a, I've seen England jersey number Harry Kane at the games. Yeah. I I see I see the the development and fans of the young kids all over the place and to your point, I think Gov put it up is, you know, it surpassed hockey. Uh, I, mean, I see more hockey. kids wearing football kits than I do Yankees really jerseys anymore. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the NHL ice hockey here, I've got a franchise just down the street for me, and, uh, you know, the season opened up, but they're, they've they been passed by by soccer in this country, uh, no doubt. And baseball, it depends on the it depends on the market. Baseball is still very huge in, in a lot of places, but other places it's an afterthought, and, and definitely the MLS, and and, and more in particular, the the – attractiveness and, and viewership of the Premier League, I think, is definitely coming on, on top of that. I mean, the NFL and NBA are still in another universe as far as American fans yeah. are concerned. Yeah. I mean, we're not we're not touching that anytime soon. Um, but yeah. it's certainly I think Jack's right. I mean, you could argue that it's it's definitely a, a tied for third. 
But more um, and more, I think parents are also in the U.S. Especially more and more parents are actually having their kids play soccer. You know, in the context that American football actually happens in the same season as sort of like when you know soccer basically starts up. And so you actually had the choice, kind of as a parent, of either sending your kid to play American football or have them play soccer. And I think yeah. nowadays more and more and more parents are actually choosing their kids to play soccer than they did American yeah. football. I, high... I played American football despite actually wanting to play soccer because all right. of my friends played American football. None of them actually ended up playing soccer. So I had to choose that one. Whereas I think if I was a kid nowadays, probably very few kids are actually picking American football, you know, over soccer, I would say. There's and some high profile safety, NFL also because of safety. Yeah. Well, that's what I say. There's some high, high profile NFL players. I think even Tom Brady, maybe one of them who are saying they're not going to have their kids play American football period. Wow. So, I mean, it's just the, the evidence is becoming too clear on, on the, on the, the safety aspect of it. So right. that's one of the reasons why I don't watch. I, I, I just, I can't watch. Uh, there are a lot of reasons I can't watch, but anyway, all right, moving the on. Safety so safety element, they're wearing helmets and flipping pads on every part of their body. Well, the problem is, is that they use the helmet to hurt you even more. So people like, you know, they lean in with their helmets and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's 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 the 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 people use brain injury advantage to hurt people like even. Yeah, it's It's because you get you get five people lining up and they just smash their heads into each other over and over and over again, year after year after year after year after year after year. And somebody was talking to Brady and they said, well, how many concussions have you had in your career? And he said, I think I had three. And then the doctor is like, wait a minute, how many times have you been hit? where when you when you fell you were kind of described the symptoms right you know like kind of the stars in the eyes a little bit that sort of stuff he's like oh thousands of times he's like well then you've had thousands of concussions Mm. so it's just it's just different anyway so the big news i guess we had was um we actually now have our full football operations in place now i guess i mean you know i don't know how many more people are gonna be employed but we now have (laughs) <laughs> if Johan, is that gonna, what we're going to call him? Uh, Johan Lang's come in as technical director with uh, effect starting the first of next month. Uh, the press release, I guess, the statement from the club says he has responsibility for recruitment, analytics, and talent identification across the senior and academy teams. Thank you for adding the slide. Um, <laughs> I, had it, I had it teed up. And sorry, um, sorry, yep, sorry. Yep. So no, no, no. I, I had it teed up. I just forgot to add it. Um, <laughs> that's why we're. A t- that's why we're. That's why we work in a team. So hey, uh, hey. he's most recently come out of uh, Aston Villa, um, and before that, he was in Copenhagen. Um, so we've got an interesting um, decision here that we. I mean, it's, it's conversation had is one is, you know, does anybody care? Does anybody really know much about him? And what do we think we're, we're going to get out of this? Because we still don't really know the operation between Munt and Scott Munn, Johan, and how all that works with the scouting network. Um, but I think that it's the, the, what's been told is that he is, because his experience in Aston Villa was attractive about him, is that clearly Villa didn't have the money that the big six have. Uh, but he was there in place when they when they went from you know near relegation he came in right after that and moved them up the table uh in using the data analysis right to supposedly find players that they could they could bring into the squad that would compete and bring the club success and i think you could argue that he certainly has uh done that if you look at the track record of villa in particular um here are some of the notable wins and losses or hits and misses that he's had while he was at villa we have uh, Matty Cash, who I know that still gets um, a Christmas card every year um, <laughs> from um, from Doc and um, Emmy Martinez uh, and Ollie Watkins, who uh, has still the lone goal at one nil in the England Australian game. Then, of course, also uh, sign Philippe Coutinho, Danny Ings and Morgan Sanson, who were less successful. So, um, Jack, we're going to start with you on this. Um, what do you mm-hmm. think of this, opinion, uh, of this appointment? Do you, do you have any strong feelings? And more importantly, uh, how do you rate him vis-a-vis Steve Hitchin? 
Anybody, <laughs> anybody can outbeat Steve. So now you're going to get me to be way too positive about Johan Lang now that I have that in mind. Um, I must say, though, that photo that he was in earlier, though, it looked like he was about to give like a presentation of the new iPhone or something like that. It's very Steve Jobs uh, sort of outfit there. So I'm quite impressed. Maybe he has a pair of new balances uh, underneath. But I feel like it maybe needed to happen just for sort of the face and the look of it. You know, if we are, you know, looked at from the outside by other clubs, it was kind of funny that we were making all these deals this summer. We didn't really know who was doing it. Was it Gabonini? Was it Paratici? Was it Daniel Levy? Was it all of the above? And now it feels like Spurs have an opportunity to sort of actually bring some clarity to that. Felt like we kind of needed some clarity to it. And so I feel like it was a necessary hire. Was this the guy that I was thinking of the whole time? Maybe not. And I also feel like he might have had as many hits as he did misses. I feel like at Aston Villa, there are a lot of players that he did bring in for around that kind of 15 to 20 million mark that I'm a little bit doubtful of. Like he brought in like Den Donker. He brought in guys like uh, Bertrand Traore, got in guys like Morgan mm-hmm. Sansone and, you know, players like that, that I feel like didn't end up working out. And of course, Paracici and plenty of other people have their misses as well. But when I sort of like totaled it up, I felt like it was like eight hits for him, seven misses. And that's not really as good of a ratio as I would have liked. But you still have to look at where Aston Villa are now since he's come into the club. Like they have soared and they have risen. They also have a very talented youth academy. I think that's also thanks to him. Apparently, that's part of his kind of speciality. He also is kind of seen as a very big data and analytics guy. Aston Villa at the time apparently needed that sort of kind of revamp. He did a good job in that department. So I'm sort of mixed on uh, Mr. Lang. It feels like he's also not the most sort of, uh, how would you put it, like outburst, you know, kind of like character personality is like Gabonini and the you know previous Italians were. He's actually a bit more to himself, a bit more kind of uh, insular, doesn't speak out too much. Apparently he only addressed like the Villa fans once and that was like in some sort of just kind of, you know, catered speech or, you know, line of some kind. Whereas Paratici in the time that he was here, you know, did, you know, come out and speak to us. That's probably because Daniel Levy didn't want to. And so he forced him to. But at least, you know, Johan Lang, uh, in comparison to Paratici, might be a bit more behind the scenes. We could, you know, see him kind of working more in secret. And also maybe last thing to mention, some of the signings that even on that list he's being credited for, I read in an athletic article, and this is also hearsay or whatever, but the athletic article said that those weren't actually really his signings. They already were looking at Ollie Watkins before he was even brought in. Apparently, that was more kind of the Perslow guy who's like the CEO over yeah. at Aston Villa. I think that was more his signing. And then that was also the case with Emiliano Martinez, I think, too. It was actually more kind of a, a signing that they already kind of had in the books, kind of already had wrapped up. And but the one that you definitely can credit him for, which I think is a brilliant signing, is that Matty Cash one. That was all Johan Lang. I think he even flew out uh, to, you know, meet him personally and get the deal done and all that sort of thing. So you could say, you know, he's had some pretty clever deals, you know, for some pretty good players. And then some other ones that you kind of scratch your head, like especially the Danny Ings one I'm a little confused by. But then to reference the athletic article, apparently that wasn't his deal. That was that Perslow guy who brought in Danny Ings and Johan Lang didn't even want him in in the first place. So I'm actually not disappointed at all. I felt like it needed to happen. Was it the guy that I was thinking of the whole time? You know, was it somebody that I was super excited by? Maybe not, but I'm definitely looking forward to what he's going to do. I'm not concerned, but I'm not going to say that I'm jumping for joy. JP, you you are the not only just on this show, the Pasta Coglu uh, expert, but you were banging the drum for him as early as February of 23, I believe. I'm and not aware so, of that. Is that true? Yeah, you know what? Remarkably so. I, 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 I fact checked it and it, I, and it is. It is absolutely true. I heard um, that rumor. Yeah, yeah, I did too. But I had to, I looked it up. I, I, I went on Snopes and it's true. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, so anyway, but uh, you, you have a better sense of his his career. How do you find him working in the past with technical directors? Do you have a sense of how he how he interacts and what kind of roles and responsibilities he's had? Because obviously this past summer, um, it was there was no one in that role and neither was really officially Scott Munn working. And he isn't really a recruiting talent identifier anyway. He's a he's an exe- you know, he's an operations football guy. So what is your feeling on this potential between the two? Yeah, I mean, one of Ange's biggest strengths is talent identification, um, which uh, I, I, that was my kind of concern coming in when we were talking about getting a director of football and then in parallel signing a manager. When we signed Ange, I was like, well, what are we going to do with this director of football? How's that going to kind of play into what he wants to do? But 
we've changed that approach and that, you know, I kind of agree Lang is a underwhelming appointment if we were hiring a director of football, but we mm. didn't. We have kind of changed that model and brought him in as a technical director. So I now see him, his role really being leading the data side of recruitment and going to Ange, hey, we need a left winger. Here are the guys we've identified. And then Ange being able to kind of filter through and go, yeah, that's the one I want. Um, so I think I think it's probably a good move in that regard. Um, I think that, you know, Don Fabio's kind of ability to consult in the background has played a large part in why we've not gone down the director of football route. He's definitely still playing that role, um, just maybe to a, a more slightly more quiet uh, tune. Um, but yeah, look, from my perspective, as long as Ange has the final say on who he wants, I've got no problem with whoever we've brought in so long as they're halfway capable because Ange can filter through the bullshit. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying it's it's not only identifying potential talents for position, but would it also work the other way where and just saying, okay, I need a left winger who has the following qualities. Go in and find the people that have matched these qualities and then let's review those together. Is that what you're kind of saying? That's kind of one thing, yeah. I would expect that the technical director would understand the philosophy the manager's playing with and understand the gaps in the squad, that that doesn't need to be a conversation. Hmm. But uh, yeah, effectively, so what do you think about this situation? Do you believe, Dave, going to you, um, with Paratici still seemingly, you know, popping up everywhere, uh, you know, still taking selfies, showing up at games here and there, uh, do you think, do you expect him to be shown the door? Um, come on out, you know, come on in uh, November 1st, Johan Lang comes in and that's the last we've seen from the Don or, or what are you expecting in, at all with, in that consultant role going forward? Do you have any insight into that? Well, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that he has been banned from doing the role that we hired him to do last season. He was banned, you know, and the fact. But not the as a consultant, is, he wasn't banned. Well, you know, you know what they say about consultants, people do and consultants consult, isn't it? But the fact of the matter answer. is, is that the governing body has said you can't do the job that you are hired to do because of financial uh, malfeasance or whatever that word is and Italian football. And it's not a very good look for us as a club to have someone involved in that. And it makes me laugh when uh, if you look at Coy's data, Dan's bio on the Spurs website, there's a couple of lines in there about how he's determined to bring about FFP in the Premier League and in its enforcement. And we all know why that is, because he doesn't want to spend any decent money on a squad. And um, at the same time, whilst he's adapting that pose, if the governing body say, well, you're, you know, the, the director of football that you hired, which by all accounts, he was warned about the investigation at the time, and he still went ahead and appointed him, uh, he, uh, he continues to pay him a consultancy fee. It's a joke. Lots um, of yeah, but the fact of the matter is, and this is this is a really good point by uh, King Hoddle, and I, and I, and it's something that an esteemed broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly, who you, you may see on the cheese room soonish, said that this obsession with who is behind the scenes and who is the director of football and who is the technical director and this that and the other is very much a modern day phenomena. You know, obviously I'm I'm an old bastard, so in, when I started going just after Elvis had carved it. Um, all we knew about behind the scenes was the physio ran out on the pitch with his bucket and sponge and uh, you had an assistant manager, the kit manager um, and then you had the first team manager who ran the whole thing left, right and centre. Um, and, and our second most successful manager in our history, Keith Berkershaw, effectively left because when a new owner came in, floated the, this, the, the football club on the stock market and wanted to make it more modern and take more power away from him. That's that's where it all began. So it's a great point that King Hoddle's made, but it's the modern day football now at the moment. And I think the key point is this, about this, as long as Ange is happy, that's all I care about, right? Because I know that we're meant to build a structure that, you know, coaches come and go, and God knows who has five in the last five years. But as long as we're in a situation where so really what it is, is mum 
is the, the footballing director. The technical director is this guy who dresses in a very dodgy jazz brown jacket and black polo neck. Um, and as long as he he's on the... I mean, he's the Jonah Hill of the operation, this this guy. He's going to do the data, the analyt analytics, and all that kind of stuff. And as long as Ange is happy, that's fine. Because there was a time in the past where Martin Yole was in. We all loved him. And then Arneson left and they brought in, Levy brought in Damien Kamoli and they didn't get on with each other. And Yol was uh, sacked. We don't want that happening again. Well, the, the, I agree. I think that's the good point, Jack, that Dave's making. And and really what you really want is make sure that the manager at this point is given the resources and the tools that you need. And, and I think more, yeah. most importantly, what we want to know is if he's good with the academy, because that clearly is, we have a manager who clearly wants to create a path from the academy into the first team. And you need, you need the whole, you need the whole structure working towards that. Absolutely. The question I have, what's most important, and I also know is most important to, to, to Dave is whether or not this new team is going to solve the 25 to 30 million pound player purchase problem 20 to 30 20 to 30 sorry 20 to 30 million dollar purchase problem that dave has so eloquently and so often talked about <laughs> on this broad on these shows um <laughs> so but i mean i think that in all seriousness i think that's the the right way to look at it we don't need to spend a lot of time on who this technical director i mean it, you know it is what it is and let's and just let this, the results speak for themselves and the first opportunity for that to come up will be obviously in the january window where we mm -hmm. all can probably say what the needs are i don't think we we have any question about where the squad has its gaps and holes uh that's clear so. Question to you, Jack. Do you believe in too many cooks in the kitchen, or do you think this is not the case? I I believe that you can that you can absolutely have too many. Um, yes, you can have too many cooks in the kitchen uh, if if they don't all have their very assigned roles, and everyone knows what the hierarchy is. Mm -hmm. Anyone's ever worked in in a actual working kitchen like I have, or watched um, um, the bear knows that the kitchen is a non-democratic very hier hierarchical structure and so i would hope that your football operations are very similar that people know what their defined roles are and there aren't people competing for power and the politics yeah. go with it now we all know that happens in every football club <laughs> but one of the things i hope is that in pasta coglu it, yeah pasta coglu does not suffer fools lightly from what i can tell and so mm. i would hope that he would quash any of that you know competing a, a agenda bs that goes on in corporate america that that football clubs are not immune from i agree good question yeah good answer can i can i just ask quickly about your cooking career what what was your signature dish in your time as a cook my signature dish would it probably be a charleston she crab soup wow Ooh. wow Hello. <laughs> doesn't doesn't really compare with my Vegemite toast though, does it? So. <laughs> I want no, it really doesn't. Uh, I can tell you that the, those two things, although they might complement each other well, they are definitely different dishes. I once was a dishwasher, so I look forward to cleaning that. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So let's go on uh, some other news before we get into the 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 sacred cow uh, food fight. Um, <laughs> We have been told that uh, we have been selected for the a host venue for Euro 28. Um, that here I am in America, extremely uh, couldn't care, and um, <laughs> <laughs> but it has it. It is good because you know what that means. Um, as Daniel said, it was always our vision that the stadium would create a new sport leisure and entertainment destination in London to be named as one of the host venues for UEFA's Euro 2028 as a testament to what we have created here. Our stadium has become renowned for its unique atmosphere. Yes, it has. And we are excited for fans from across Europe to come and experience this in five years time. So clearly this is another example of the multi-purpose stadium that you love and, 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 and uh, talk about all the time, Dave, bringing more mm. revenue to the football side of the business. Every so, penny. Uh, every penny. Every penny. So we Can should I, expect good, good things to come. This is sort of off topic and maybe slightly related to this, but I'm noticing this trend that's happening right now in football where it seems like there's no like just sole like 
host country for anything anymore because it's a lot of overhead. It's a lot of cost. I think there's a lot of data that shows that hosting the Olympics for most countries in no way really actually benefits you in the long run. It actually kind of ends up hurting you economically in a lot of cases. And I think that's probably could be the case with the World Cup, could be the case with the Euros. And so mm. we're seeing now it's like, on, like the countries are like dividing it up so that they only have to invest so much and then they can actually reap the benefits, reap the rewards, reap the the you know the the revenue without actually having to spend all that much and really have Good to point. you know host all these countries <laughs> but the one th or the one thing i kind of have an issue with it though is just that all the at the same time they're preaching you know we want to you know lessen our carbon footprint we want to lessen you know like miles traveled for everybody so it's like it's kind of i don't know it's counterintuitive and it's a bit hypocritical to you know drive all these sort of like you know we want to be zero carbon emission by this stage but at the same time you know you're making fans travel you know four flights you know during like one tournament that seems a bit sort of i think you made a really becoming a trend just a really good point about you know the capability of the city hosting a major international here we event. go as J soon J as you started speaking jack as soon as you started speaking i could see the glint in davo's eye and here it was coming all right have you jp been? any any comment around that you know given that melbourne don't want to host the europa conference league of the athletics uh, calendar the commonwealth games over to you that in the 21st century, the Imperial Games is still a thing baffles me. Uh, and it should have been cancelled long ago. The end. I agree, so, but you're still not hosting it. <laughs> we are not, no. Well, interestingly, apart from Wembley, the only London club to host in the Euros will be the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, which by that time could still be named the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. <laughs> um so the question is that I ask, you know, uh, you, JP, is that does this mean that, you know, the Spurs are clearly the, the go-to destination for Europe, European events and, and on the European stage, we are the premier club for these purposes? Is that is that what we should expect? I'm pretty sure there's more than one stadium hosting the Euros, but um, sure, no. let's take it. <laughs> In London, outside of Wembley, they're uh, we're the only well, club. Well, we're, we're the premier club in London. That was that was decided long ago. We're just waiting for the trophies to come along. We gave everyone else a head start. Well, I was I'm glad Gov said this because I don't pay I don't spend I don't spend a lot of time on on Twitter and social media, so I didn't know what the reaction was. I know that there's a lot of of Liverpool fans upset that a yet to be built stadium in Everton's ground is gonna is gonna host. Uh, being funded by a group that can't pay its credit card bills here in America, and then you've got the uh, you've got the Etihad selected over the decrepit and, and falling apart uh, Old Trafford, which is making many United fans upset. So it seems that the Euro UEFA has managed to uh, antagonize the already bright fault lines among the fan bases across this country. It seems so. That's good. That's a good win. I like that. Um, so yeah. What I thought we would turn to now, which is really the, the, the meat and potatoes, is our, our return of our famous and much loved sacred cow segments. And at this point, we have 73 people watching. And so we're now going to mark how quickly the watch list drops as we move into the, the sacred cow segment. And for the first sacred cow, it pits your host, me, Jack H. Bottom right corner. We have JP at the other end of the of the planet, and we are going to take on the topic of Pierre Emile Hoiberg. And for the the side that is arguing for PH, that will be me, and against will be JP. And as I am always a um, a person of very kind, generous attitude, I will let you, if you would like, to go first. So I've got the I've got the clock ready. So it's two minutes. Um, and as to the point that was made, you know it must be the international <coughs> break when sacred cow is on. I I I would say that given that we last this year got 42 minutes of content out of Preston away in the cup, I resent that comment <laughs> hugely. <laughs> There's no link whatsoever. So JP, you going first? Disappointed when in I the lack of flappy hands photos here. <laughs> uh, excuse me, that is a flappy hands photo. I picked it. These hands are prevalent. That's a closed fist. 
Well, I tried to find something with his hands are visible. I was going to put one of those flappy wind tunnel things at an airport, but I thought it was too obscure. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, JP, you good to go? When I say go, ready, steady, go. Yeah, well, I'm going to try and save some viewers for you uh, so that you get someone <laughs> left to speak to, Jack. I won't need to, uh, two minutes. I will start with why we signed Pierre Milhoy there. We signed him at a time where he was uh, the best in the league at one thing and one thing only, and that was interceptions. And he was signed to unlock the creative ability of Tongi Ndombele and Giovanni Lo Celso. And how well did that go for us? You could argue he had one role to make those two players work, neither of whom have worked, should we say any more. Then you'll have the argument, which I'm sure Jack will come to, that he's played every minute available for him for Spurs. He's been one of our most consistent performers, to which I will throw back at you, of undoubtedly the most boring team any of us have ever watched. He always looked better when Oliver Skip played next to him. We get a manager to come in who plays attacking, attractive football, and he goes, oh, you are incapable of playing in this role. Happy for you to leave. Enough said. <laughs> you got you got another forty six seconds. Is that it? Oh, don't need him. Imp- don't need him. I've already lost five for watches, that, so I that, got a lot of That's impressive. That's impressive. Okay. So how many did we have how many views did we have at the start before JP? I think seventy four. Seventy four right, is the count I so saw. You've lost four. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, right. Okay, so Jack, uh, when I say go, you ready? Yep. Go. Pierre, just last season alone, had 12 goals and assists in all competitions, um, and in a very in a team that was not very good offensively. I decided to look at think about it this way: that you know he is rarely injured, he's never been sent off, only two red cards in his career, and he's an exceptionally uh, dependable player. And realistically, I decided to say, you know what, but maybe I'm, I'm biased because I watched him and I, and I own a shirt with his number on it, so I'm not seeing this. So let's do a little comparison with other midfielders that are his profile. So I just decided to look at last season, look at Rice, Partey, Brozovic, Palina, and Piscina over in Italy. And I found out his, just his domestic season, he had the highest goal involvement at nine of, the, of, the, of that group of six, tied first on shots, second only to Partey on successful take-ons, second in pass completion, first in long passes. Now, where he was, as you mentioned, tackle success, he was fifth in that group of six, and he was well below in his tackle success, which is what you said he was brought in here to do, is kind of be that defensive stop. But I'd argue that playing a two-man midfield half the year was Skip. I think he was worse with Skip. He was really, it was when Bentecourt went down that he really, his, his game really fell off, and I think it is, has a lot to do with the whole team drop-off. I mean, he was first among that group in touches and carries, third in progressive carries, second in progressive passes that were completed over 10 yards. So I feel that, you know, heck, he was the, got the game winner in the, what, the 105th minute it felt like in the clinching game that got us first in the group in the, in the, in the CL with a goal that I think is as good as you're going to find in the group stage. So from my perspective, he has gotten unfairly take uh, a grief from the fan base for a system that was dross being told to do something that, you know, I don't know that anyone had been successful with. And I think that in his cameo roles and lo- helping lock down the games that he's come into, he's been very good. The and just phone looking- has run. Can you hear that? Yep, yep, I'm phone. done. And well, I lost two viewers. You've lost. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> so you've lost. Two. So basically, one of the ways that we can judge this from now on is who has lost the most. And whoever's lost the most has lost the thing. So, uh, you know, sitting here is uh, sitting here is the, 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 you know, the architects of Sacred Cow. It took me hours to put this concept together last year or the year before. Uh, you know, my, my view is is that, you know, Jack went into it with a lot of research. Uh, you know, he clearly thought about it. And I was told off once for having a whole list of facts and figures in front of me. I'm obviously talking about Levy, probably. But a, a, a very well-researched, a very well-thought-out argument. But, but that's in, in keeping with the kind of the well-researched and well-thought-out persona that, uh, that Jack brings to the show. Whereas JP, though, he's more, he's more of a man from the hip. 
he wore shoes from the hip. <laughs> he, he, he's, uh, you know, he, he's, you know, he's, he's of a of a creative background. He's, he's got his, his, he has a kind of uh, a wall of different caps and beanies he decides to wear every day. And uh, and and he didn't put the. He made the one big mistake of sacred cow. You didn't use up your two minutes. <laughs> mm. Flat flat cow. Any any feedback for the gents? Disappointed in the lack of Hoiberg versus Winks comparisons, uh, I, believe within, <laughs> I believe within a season and a half, because one of my favorite things about Hoiberg was he, at one stage, people start to say, let's just throw, like, people were so upset at one stage with Hoiberg, he didn't understand why, that they actually were saying, let's put Winks back into the team. And I don't think they realized that within a season and a half, Hoiberg had already done more assists and goals and had played more minutes than Winks had in his entire career as a Spurs player. And that's where, even if you hate Hoiberg or not, players that used to get a lot of protection and a lot of love at this club were definitely nowhere near, I think, as scrutinized or as like kind of criticized as someone like Pierre was, despite this guy at the end of the day being far better than the players we had previously. Again, whether you like him or not, and I'm going to make that sort of kind of argument with some of the players that even Paratici brought in, you know, kind of like compared to the guys that we had previously. Boy, Perk has done a good job for us. But yeah, I think you guys well, covered it. That's Disappointed an, in the lacks of Winks comparisons. Well, I appreciate the, t the and, I, and I take the criticism uh, to heart. And I think that's a great transition for our next sacred cow. And that is a man who needs no introduction and a great photo to say the least, uh, I'd say, is that is a perfect capture of the Don. So we have two people, the other guests. We have Dave, who is going to uh, stretch his debating skills and somehow come up of the arguments against Paratishi. And on the for Paratishi side, it will be Jack. So I will let the two of you decide who is going to go first. Uh, and I will also time you. Okay, so before we start, I just want to do a Fergie psych psychological warfare on you, Jack. This this question come in. Any skeletons in that cupboard? There's a bit of a comment. I, just I wasn't come clever in. enough. I, I was going to write back to uh, Adrian. I said he'll mess he's back there, but I was like, that's not very funny. And I was like, I couldn't come up with somebody clever. Uh, so I mm. apologize, Adrian. I need to come up with a good skeleton. Mm, that's why right, you know. I just thought. So do you want to? Do you want to go? Would you like me to go first, Jack? It's up to you. I'm offering it to you genuinely. What would you like? You have no preference. I have. I, I'm, my preference is your preference, my friend. Might as well just get it over and done with. I can go first. Okay. Okay. All right. And, uh, then you're ready. You're on the timer, Jack. Yeah, I'm on the okay. timer. So three, two, one. We have to start, I think, with Paratrici. That a man who I believe saved our football club. I think he inherited a dumpster fire that was left uh, behind by the previous uh, director of football who shall not be named uh, in order for me to uh, stay well behaved. But he did come in and he had sort of multiple problems that I feel like he had to deal with. He had pretty much a pretty terrible starting 11. There were only maybe a few players in it that we actually could say were of real quality that deserved to play for Tottenham Hotspur. He had no real squad depth of any kind. Most of the time, Spurs fans were pretty disappointed with what we had off the bench to pick from. We had no academy talent whatsoever. I think the three players that we had produced in the time that the man who shall not be named was there was Tanganga, Skip, as well as Harry Winks. We also had lots of Deadwood. In fact, so much Deadwood that I think in the time that he was here, I think it was like over, if I recall with my research, it was like 18 players I think he got rid of in the span of, you know, two seasons. He had loaned out multiple players twice, three times, if not four times, trying to get rid of that Deadwood. He was very effective in it. He also came in where there was no data or analytics department at Tottenham whatsoever, he even said that it was actually a bit in the dark ages at the time. And he was really concerned by also even the lack of scouts that were even at the club in the first place. So he brought in guys like Gabonini, brought in guys like Greatar Steinson, brought in guys like Rob Holding that I think actually, again, also transformed our football club. He was somebody that wasn't going to take it all on himself. He trusted others to bring into the team, beefed up basically the whole recruitment department, and we're seeing the rewards of it. Listing four players that he brought in for under 20 million, Udoji, Vicario, Bentoncourt, and Pop Matasar, he all brought in for under 20 million. Those are guys that I think we all probably would say are some of our favorite players and are probably now some of our best players that we've signed in maybe the last 10 years. Even guys like Emerson Royale, who most of the fans seem to hate for reasons I don't really understand, has actually played more games than Ryan Sessegnon has and actually has more goal contributions than I believe Ryan Sessegnon has in the time that he's been at this football club. And, he and also that's two. Less. All right. 
Oh, that was a good, was good. good solid was, two minutes. Oh. Good, solid two minutes there, Jack. Well, All right. Good. And you only lost two viewers. So <laughs> it's getting ready for 20. <laughs> so I, I will say wow. the topic of Paratici lost us about four before we even started. <laughs> six, so it really was six. Oh, dear. All right. Well, that's, I, that's Dave's fault. All right. <laughs> Dave, tell me yes. when you're ready. I am as, as good to go. All right. Three, two, one. So, ladies and gentlemen, cast your minds back to the summer of 2021. Koi's data, Dan, writes in his program notes, we are going to get our DNA back. DNA. We're going to play the flamboyant, exciting football that we are known for. And his first move is to get in Paratici, a man that he said he's had lots of dealing with over the years. Uh, one failed Dybala deal. But anyway, so in comes Paratici. He's, if his benchmark is to be compared against someone who is really crap, then we must laud Daniel Levy for being as good as Alan Sugar. And that's not quite how the way it works. So in terms of dealing with some of the points that my esteemed friend, normally from New York, but currently in Seattle with Aslan in the cupboard behind him, would say, <laughs> uh, in terms of the Deadwood, as so I sit here now, we've got 5,000 players on the books. We haven't got rid of the Celso. We haven't got rid of uh, Ndombele. Mm. There's a lot of Deadwood knocking around. That's If we've had a lot of Deadwood two years ago, we've still got Deadwood now. Now, let's go back to the DNA point a minute. So, in terms of the DNA that we wanted and the managerial search of, the, of those halcyon days of summer of 2021, what did we get? Uh, he tried to get in Gattuso, whose uh, political views are more in line with Mussolini. Uh, the fans revolted. He didn't come in. But in the end, his first managerial appointment came through the door. The man who was going to capture the DNA of our club. Yes, none other than Nuno Espiritus Spantos, whatever his name. I've spelled bad and said badly. <laughs> he didn't bring back the DNA. It wasn't very good. So therefore, we had him playing more awful football. And then that was the end of it. Then after after that, when we're all in a lot of trouble and the fans aren't happy, and the last game with Nuno in charge, what do we do? We go back to Conte, we give him another much more money, and in he comes. Now, I like Conte, I think he did a good job. I lost, I'm out of time already. I had loads more. Conte, that's it. No. You got to watch your time. You got to time yourself. I mean, you're going to give yourself going to give yourself a limit of two minutes. You got to plan your speech out so that you hit Daniel all your Harrison salient points. You spent too much time on Levy. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> See, I, this whole thing was really just a whole attempt and and sleight of hand to you know, slam slam, slam Heat Levy. You don't no. want to distract yourself. <laughs> No, I, I had my killer point was about the point that was made about you've got to buy players to suit the manager and the style. So Dan Juma, Spence, Hill, uh, I had loads, but and then I didn't you even just get didn't use about, your time. You didn't use oh. your time wisely. Oh. And uh, let me tell you something. I can already tell you that your notes are a clear winner, but we can't judge the notes. What we have mm. to judge is the performance, JP. He got in the manager part though, which Gov is right about. Like that's where you that's probably where you you know hit hard on Pratchy the most is that he Correct. Did not and that should have been the manager. first fifteen seconds. Take a little take a little take a little bit from from your your fellow countryman and JP and how he just went the highlights, the sub just and just walked away and left time. He could have passed you time and you still would have been talking about <laughs> you, Nuno. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair though, I think you hit you hit the key points very quickly and very well. Well not quickly. You hit the key points <laughs> <laughs> in, in the manager. Um I will say though Jack uh any statement that starts with the man that saved our club and isn't immediately followed up with Ange Postacoglu uh, oh, here we go. <laughs> but you, you then went one did, step further. What players further. did he inherit? Which players did he inherit? You Paratici's then went players. one step further and started talking about how Paratici uh, revolutionized our recruitment part um, department and then name dropped all the people that have since left. So <laughs> <laughs> they still did a great job in the time that they were here. <laughs> so, um, how did we so go I, on the most important metrics of uh, I, I how many viewers did I lose? 
Well, we're back up to 71. So, I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, I think maybe we might have to have a, I mean, might have a push here. I'm not really sure because your arguments were, there was one in two minutes, maybe two, and yet we gained viewers. So, I don't mm. know. It's kind of hard Who's to say. I, I mean, yeah. I, I feel like Jack had the stronger case, although JP makes some good points. But he gripped the audience. <laughs> yeah, he really did. I think it's just the delivery style and 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 your eloquence that might have won the day there. Um, but may, I was going to say to your point, Jack, it. that really is. I think I think the real genius of Parachi is he knew who the next manager was going to be, and he was already <laughs> buying for that guy. That's mm. the four dimensional chess that he's been playing by stocking these young talented players that would be uh, on loan for a year and then show up at the club at the same time that the savior walks through and has ready to use them. So I don't know. Mm, no, I think let's, that's very let's good be point, honest. Man. The real genius of Paratici is his ability to keep himself in a job despite being in prison. You know, that's, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> he's not oh, in prison, yeah. is he? No, he's not. No, no, no. <laughs> we'll he's take, just we'll excommunicated yeah. from football. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Well, uh, it seems like we have one person who, who thinks sacred cow is great. So what we could do is we could do a, we, we, <laughs> That's two people, including two people. me. Yeah. <laughs> including you. No, in all seriousness, I actually We're think this... We're not going to hear the end of it now, Gov. Thanks for that. <laughs> I, I think this should be a recurring Friday theme, um, the agree. Sacred Cow. I mean, it only takes six, seven minutes to go through. I think it's an excellent idea, and I think we could real, build a real following of people similar-minded to Dave, and we would have a great, you know, loyal <laughs> audience, and, and it's a good idea. <laughs> the world think, would be a better uh, place. Uh, and yeah, all these exactly. similarly minded people like myself, even for me, is a very yeah. disturbing thought. Yes. So anyway, so the just the final was uh, it did I end actually one forgot nil. to mention too. I did forget to mention also my love for Paratici came with so much scrutiny. I remember in the beginning. So I can say, you know, if I were ever to claim, you know, a hipster, I was there first. I think I could say that with the Paratici from the moment he was hired, Dave, Dave, the other Harris. Uh, and I called him the Don. I don't even think he made one signing yet. And we called him the Don just because it was fun, just because it was a bit of uh, humor. I remember a lot of channels called us the Parachichi twins. They made plenty of segments about what we were talking about. Is he a Don? Is he a con? And uh, yeah, feels good to be kind of one of the main founders of the uh, Parachichi propaganda team. And uh, yeah, and we're now in full circle. And there you go. There's the Don Vito Corleone back. You have I Fabio. Will, I'll have Ange. Mm. That's right. Excellent. That's a good. That's a good trade. I'll I'll, I'll say it with you on that. Well, the good news, Kerry, is that uh, he stayed fit in the game today because he didn't play. I unless he, he was play. subbed. Unless he was subbed in later no, than the started. game that I saw. Didn't you I saw start? I, 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 saw I was it. looking for. Yeah. Him. I was looking for him on the, among the subs. <laughs> no, no. I saw. I saw. Him ta- I saw him definitely take it. Oh my bad. That's like, how closely I pay attention to it English like he international football. Started in midfield though, which is a good sign. Like it looked like he didn't play out on the left, from what I can. Well, in all right seriousness, now. I was I was listening to a very interesting conversation um, on Southgate and the English squad and its outlook for the Euros this morning with the Athletics uh, Tactical Podcast. And and one of the things that they didn't say specifically, but annoyed me, they talked about Madison being played on left wing. I was like, you know, here you have, if it weren't for Jude Bellingham, you know, you, you, you wouldn't have this issue, but you, there's no way that Jude Bellingham is going to take a backseat to anyone if he's going to play underneath the striker. I mean, he's the best midfielder in the world right now, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so where do you play Madison, um, you know, because I don't think Callan Phillips is strong enough to play the base of the midfield at a high level at the international game. At least he hasn't proven that so far. So you can't necessarily play, you know, like two eights, but it'd be great if you could play Bellingham and Madison together underneath the forward line. I think that would be fantastic. But you have well, a manager. You, have Rice there, you don't need so to prove have... yourself to play for Southgate, though. So, uh, sh- yeah. Rice, Rice, Bellingham, and Madison should be a nailed yeah. on. That's a no brainer. Yeah, people. but Rice is going to be hurt for the to the Euros. So, because you're... he's always injured, right? No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, it's just a, you know, cross because that means he's, he loses a season for Arsenal. He's out for the Euros. So it's a perfect, it's a win-win. Oh, right. you know, oh I, see, I see, I see, I see, I see. In this, in this world where there's, you know, five key factors that have to go for us to, to right. win the league. <laughs> That's one of them. Rice not playing in the Euros is one of them. <laughs> I'm anyway. very annoyed that we didn't get to, I normally like to ask Gov uh, what whiskey or bourbon he's drinking today, but he's off now because he's, he sits in his garden on a Friday afternoon and he, and he has a very nice 
Well, Whiskey bourbon. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, <clears throat> um, no, I, 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 you know, the international break is here and we have to wait with bated breath every time one of, one of our key players is going to step on the pitch. Um, mm. And, and I'll tell you, um, Jurgen Klinsmann is going to forever be among the, my most hated individuals if anything happens to Sun. Uh, he's already halfway he did, there. He did, he did score a lot of goals for us and provided us with a lot of pleasure. Uh, yeah, days, I know. I know. I know. He prevented us from getting re- relegated, but he could undo all of that by having some horrible long-term injury for son when he should be rusted. But anyway, sounds okay. like another candidate for, for sacred cow at some. He point joins now. the long list of great players, not so great managers. Got um, that right. Mm-hmm. Any any American fan? I mean, he's got a ceiling on his managerial ability. That's all. He was at Airtel Berlin as well, and he was probably yeah. one of the worst managers I'd ever seen at Airtel yeah. Berlin. Yep. All right. I think we've gotten a good solid 60, 63 minutes in. We still have 65 people watching, poor souls. Um, I want to thank my, my guests, my fellow countrymen. Uh, Jack, thank you for joining us. I appreciate you making a Friday night appearance. Thank you for having me. Um, my Aussie, slightly Aussie jacket color was unintentional, but, you know, looked like it didn't uh, almost, you know, served enough luck. So uh, I wish that they had gotten the draw uh, today, but, you know, gave England a little bit of trouble. And hopefully I gave Dave Harris a little bit of trouble in that uh, Parachichi debate as well. You did. J- JP, your insights into Postacoglu are always very welcome. I learn something every time <laughs> you come on. I appreciate it. Thank you for getting up early, I think, I guess, on a, on a Saturday. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to my mad ramblings. And, um, you know, I'm glad that uh, the England football team were able to finally show their class and uh, overrun the mid Australia's midfield of Jackson Irvine and Connor Metcalf. So uh, well done, England. You've done it. Um, the Bundesliga 2 can now uh, get Jackson Irvine back. So there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Dave? Thank you for uh, doing all the hard work to have this an easy hosting job for me. I appreciate it. It's an absolute pleasure. And uh, it's great that we got some content out of an international break in the <laughs> shape and form that we did. Right. So uh, no, pleasure to be on. All right. Thank you very much. And remember, come on, you Spurs. Come on, you Spurs. Come on, you Spurs. <laughs>